Hi guys, this is Kevin Linnaeus. I'm a seminarian at Kenrick Glennon Seminary uh, there in St. Louis, uh, studying for the Diocese of San Angelo in West Texas. Um, you know, it's been a gift for me to be with you guys throughout this year. But as I'm sure many of you have heard or can guess that um, we've all been sent home. And so uh, I'm here in San Angelo, Texas at our Diocesan Retreat Center for the rest of the semester doing online classes. Um, and though I won't be able to, to get back to Troy anytime soon, um, I have been thinking and praying for you guys. Um, many of you have, have touched my life. Uh, the other seminarian that was with me, Chris Rumback, both of us have talked and we've both talked that we are very much missing our people in Troy, um, but know that you are in our prayers, in our daily prayers, and know that we will, God willing, be back to visit at some point. Who knows when, but we'll be back. But I'm here today just to offer a brief reflection on today's readings. So today, the Saturday of the fourth week of Lent, uh, we have in the gospel today where basically Jesus isn't saying anything in the gospel today, but it's this account of people responding to Jesus's words. Um, they're responding to Jesus's words of yesterday's gospel, of Friday. And yesterday, Jesus said this in the gospel. He says, He's questioning the, these people, the crowds, the Pharisees, and he questions them, saying, You know me, and you know where I come from, but I have not come of my own accord. He who sent me is true, and him you do not know. I know him, for I come from him, and he sent me. So Jesus is obviously talking about his relationship to God the Father, saying that I am one with him, I've been sent from him, I know him, and through that, Jesus is communicating to them, he's communicating to us, that he is divine, that he is the Son of God, that he is the Messiah, and that he, in fact, is God himself. And so today in the gospel, people are responding to that huge claim. And so we have some who are saying, we believe he is the Christ, we believe he's the Messiah, that they have eyes of faith and they see there's something deeper going on uh, about this person right in front of them, telling them him, telling them these things. But the other side, the division, it says there a division occurred among them. The other side cannot accept that he is the Messiah. They said, you know, what can come out of Galilee? Isn't that isn't the Messiah supposed to come from this town or that town? Or he's not doing Messiah-like things that we think he should be doing. So others can't believe he's the Savior, but as really because Jesus is not conforming to their ideas of what a Messiah should be, their ideas of what a Savior should be. And, you know, I think about that, um, just this question of, you know, do, do we do that? Um, do, do we often question Jesus because he's not living up to our expectations or what we think he should be doing? Uh, I know that I have a tendency to do that for sure. Um, and stuff like this often can come out in times of difficulty or in crisis, um, especially of what we're dealing with today with the coronavirus pandemic. That in these times of difficulty and distress, we're certainly in uncharted waters here, and there's a lot of uncertainty and anxiety. I think those are two of our biggest hurdles right now in terms of our interior lives is uncertainty, anxiety, and fear. And we could often find ourselves saying, what's going on, you know, is, is, is all this real? Is all this God stuff real? Look what's happening in the world. It seems to be falling apart. Um, none of us have lived through anything like this before. But Jesus is right here, you know, in, in yesterday's gospel, and in, in, in part in today's gospel, he's telling us, I'm here. I am God. I am the Savior. I'm not just some dude. Like, I'm here. And back 2,000 years ago, when these crowds are listening to Jesus, and in today's gospel, they're responding to him, that they wanted a Savior that would save them from Roman oppression. So all the Jews 2,000 years ago were under the impression of Rome and the, all the authorities, and, of the Roman authorities, and they expected that if the Messiah was to come now, that he would come as this glorious warrior king, that he would ride in and destroy Rome 
and save them from Rome so that they could leave happy, peaceful lives there in the Holy Land. Basically, they wanted a Savior that would give them whatever they wanted. They wanted a Savior that would give them this worldly peace, that everything's just fine and dandy, all of their problems are solved. But we know that Jesus didn't come to do that. We, we have a Savior who came to die on the cross. We have a Savior that, if you just look at him from a worldly perspective, he seems like a total failure. Um, that his whole, his whole um, band of brothers, his disciples, just abandoned him completely at the time of his death. And then he was brutally murdered and crucified um, and died. But Jesus willed that. Jesus had total control all over all of that. And we know from our Christian faith that he rose from the dead, that he redeemed, he redeemed us, he redeemed the world through his suffering and through his death. And so we have a God, we have a Savior who wills to bring redemption about through suffering and through death. So that we know that God never directly wills that we suffer and die, like those aren't good things, but he uses them to bring out a greater good. So, yeah, I think we all have a tendency perhaps to wonder, why is God allowing this to happen? Why doesn't he just fix it? You know, just like the Christians 2,000 years ago were saying, if there's a Messiah here, why wouldn't he just be saving us from the Romans? Look, we're, we're all in distress and we're under these Roman persecutors. Why is he not doing anything about it? He can't be the Messiah. You know, we could be saying the same things or, or thinking or feeling the same things. But we can see that God wants to do something deeper, wants to do something more profound, he wants to give us something deeper than just worldly security and worldly peace where I know exactly what my schedule looks like in two months and I can watch Netflix in peace, you know? <laughs> That's always nice, but right now we're in a great time of uncertainty. So our Savior is here in the midst of all this stuff. We know that. And that this crisis is not some random occurrence. Um, it's not just like God is looking down from heaven and saying, oh, wow, they're going through a crisis. I hope they're okay. Um, no, we know that he's here. And, you know, while we wouldn't go as far to say perhaps that this is God's vengeance, that he's punishing us, I do think that there is some element in purification in this crisis. And I say that because we know we have a God that will give us a share in his cross that he wants to give us a share in this, his suffering, in his death, so that he can bring about our new life, our resurrection, our death to our selfishness. So it's through this suffering and death, through these times of uncertainty and trial, that we learn who we are, we learn what we're made of, we learn how to live for other people and not just for ourselves. We can allow this situation to teach us many things, allow God to teach us many things through this. And for me, at least, the number one thing I'm learning through all of this is that I have to trust more because um, I like my calendar, I like my organization, I like things to be very set, um, and all of that had to change in, in, uh, in days. You know, I'm sure many of us experienced that. Um, and I don't know where I'm going to be in two months. Who knows? Um, I don't know how my family is going to, to do. But we learn to trust. We learn that God is who he says he is. Because even if the whole world, everything around us is so unstable, we know that God is with us. So we can only attain salvation through suffering, through purification, we attain our resurrection through Jesus Christ, through his death on the cross. And this Lent, it's surely a special one, isn't it? If we look at this Lent from the eyes of Jesus, that this Lent has a great lesson to teach us, that we're in this school, we're in a school of trust, we're in a school of learning how to hope, even in the midst of seeming darkness and distress. And of all of this, we know that Jesus is here. We know that he is God. And we can respond to him in faith 
saying, God is bigger than just my ideas of what I think should happen. God is with me. He loves me. And we trust him. We trust him because Jesus is here and he is God. And he is in control of everything. And he's bigger than us. Know that I'll be praying for all of you. And thank you very much for all of your prayers for us and for welcoming both Chris and I into your parish community over these uh, past few months. I'll be praying for you. God bless.